I have my drawings from last week's class. I went through and finished up all the in-betweens on them. And I've ended up with 43 drawings. I have 43A here. And I'll explain to you the reason that I have that. I have also have the same thing at the beginning. You'll see how I have number one. Oh, I didn't do it for number one, actually. No, I didn't do it for number one because I was thinking of the, uh, the jump up and down. Uh, number one, the ball's coming in, and then it bounces to the stop. And then what happens is at the very end, I have 43, which was my last run, where the ball actually stops. And then I have a trace back, number 43A. The trace back is simply so that when you shoot it, you have two balls that are in the exact same position, but it just gives it a little bit of a, a movement to it that it makes it feel like it's alive or breathing to a certain extent, and it doesn't become a static ball. So you'll find that as you draw your, your animation and then you get to the end point where your character stops, if you just hold on that one single drawing, the, the drawing freezes, and the character looks like they're actually frozen in space. And so we want to try and avoid that by adding in what's called a trace back, which is the exact same drawing, trace back over, and replicate it in the exact same way, and then you just shoot them alternately. Sometimes you'll do it with three drawings. So you have a three drawing random cycle, one, two, three, two, three, one, three, one, two, three, three, two, et cetera, et cetera. And it just gives the character just a little bit of a shimmy so that they look like they're actually still alive. So I added that onto the end. So I've got 43 drawings overall. And I followed the timing charts that we had set out before. So here's my overall action starting up here. The ball comes in, bounces. comes to its final rolling stop at the very end. So if you followed the exact same procedure that I did in the last class, you'll end up with the basically the exact same results that I have here. They should all look essentially the same. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go back and, uh, and add in the second ball. So just as we did with the perpetual ball bounce, we're just going to straight ahead animate this. Now, um, I'm going to do two different variations. One, the first variation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a second ball onto the top of it as if this is the, the belly of the character and they've got a torso that's up here, like their chest is up above. And I'm going to try and keep it so that it's balanced on the top as if um, the, the character that I have in mind, and this is something that I want you to do as well, I'm just backing up slightly here to, to give you a reasoning behind this. Anytime you're doing animation, in this instance here, we're simply fulfilling the requirements of something that I said, do this, this, and this. Which means I want the ball to come in, it hits here, it bounces up in the air to this height, it comes down, it bounces again, bounces again, and then rolls to a stop over the side. So I've given you very specific outline as to what exactly I want it done, and I showed you how to do it, and I showed you the, the tracing, and in the booklet you can see it, on the website you can see it, so all you had to do is just copy what I did. But in animation as a general statement, anything that you do has to be for a purpose or a reason. Otherwise, you're just drawing for no real good reason other than to see a bunch of drawings moving around on screen, which is you know, nice, but what's it going to get you? So what we want to do is we want to start to think in terms of what is this that I'm animating? What's the purpose of these drawings? What is it saying to the audience that hopefully will be watching it? And so. When I'm thinking of this, uh, at first I was just thinking the ball bounce, but now I have to go beyond that and start to think of a character. And I have to think of why the character is doing what the character is doing. So in my case here, what I want to do is I want to add a torso up here that's sort of an oval. Because in my mind, what I want to do is I want to draw a character that's a dragon. And this dragon character is actually going to have a neck on top of this. It goes like this, and then his head will be like this, and then he'll have a nose that comes out like this, and eyes that are like this. And then he'll have wings on his back, little arms sticking out here. tail coming out like that. Right? So that'll be my end result character. And so what I want to do is I want to have this character come in and bounce as if he's been you know, flying around and suddenly he lost his power to fly and he's crash landing onto the ground. And he bounces to a stop over here and rolls around to this, this final position. So I have to understand who my character is 
and what it is that they're doing. So I'm just creating a little scenario as to what the character is going to do. And I have to have that in my mind before I start because everything that I do from this point on will dictate that this is what the character is going to do and how the character is going to do it. So if I don't know what my character is going to do, I can't do the drawings for it. I'd, I'd start making it up as I went along, and that's not the way we work in animation. We always have to have a firm idea in our mind ahead of time as to what it is that we're going to do. Otherwise, we're just wasting our time. Right? You're guessing, you're making mistakes, you're having to redraw something, and it just is not the proper way to do it. So, A, you have to come up with an idea. And this goes for any type of a production as well. If you're working on a television show, you have to have the initial idea. You don't just walk into a studio and say, I want to make an animated cartoon. What, they're, what are they going to say? They're going to say, well, what's your idea? And you'll say, well, I don't know. I figured I'd sort of think about it while you're paying me. <laughs> they're not going to hire you to do that. You have to walk in the door with an actual idea in your head. And the same thing is true with your animation. So have the idea as to what you want to do. So in this class right now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of what you could do, right? And if you want to, you can just make notes on the side sheet of paper, uh, you know, little sketches, thumbnail sketches of what the, the positions are. So on a separate sheet, just as we did last week, you'll remember when we first started off the assignment, we just pulled out a sheet of paper and we traced off the overall path of action. So we started off here, we had the ball coming in from here, hits the ground, bounces, goes up to this height, bounces, 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 and then rolls to a stop. Right? So if you want to do that, you can sketch that out on this sheet, sheet of paper. Loosely just draw in where your key positions are like this. Just really rough sketching it like that. And then over top of these drawings, you might have your stretch position here, a stretch position here, etc., etc. Over top of these drawings, then I want you to draw wherever you feel. So you're going to have two variations of it based on what I talked about today. It'll just give you an overall snapshot of here's what's going on. And then it's up to you to decide which one you want to do. If you want to replicate exactly what I'm doing, go ahead and replicate the exact same thing. I'm okay with that. Or if you want to come up with a variation on it, then you come up with a variation. All right? just depends on how confident you feel about your work. Uh -huh. So the idea behind this assignment now is that I want you to stretch your legs a little bit, get the principle down, and understand what it is that's going on with the character and how it's working. So we've got overlapping action, stretch, and squash. Those are the two main principles. It has to work. So whatever you choose to do, it just has to work. All right? That's the parameter for it. Same thing with all the other <coughs> assignments that we've been doing all along. It's either right or it's wrong. And you've seen that in all of the, the classes that we've been doing up until this point when I'm reviewing your work in the, the video room there. I say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And I don't give you the grade unless you've actually got it right. So you have to go back, fix it up, and then come back with the proper version. All right, so this first one, uh, my first two drawings are up here. So when this one comes in, I'm not really going to see too much here. I might see just a sliver of his upper torso there, but not really a lot. This next one here is where I'm going to start to introduce it. So I'm going to have my path of action comes down like this. So I'm having this second ball that's attached here is going to be trailing on the angle that he's coming in on. So I'm assuming that he's, he's sort of coming from this direction over here and he's just sort of falling into view. So it's the same thing that we did with the tail, the double ball with the tail, which we will add a tail onto this, by the way. And my character, the, the dragon, has a little tail trailing behind him. So um, we'll talk about that after we've gone through and done uh, the second ball here. So there's my second ball on this next one. And like I said, we're just straight ahead animating it, just following through with the action of what's taking place on the primary ball. Now in this instance here, because the ball is beginning to stretch as it comes down, you can see the, the drawings there, and I'm introducing to you now a, a new way of uh, flipping your animation. You take each of the drawings and you stick them in between your fingers like this, and it's called roll flipping. So you take the entire stack of drawings and you just roll them like this, back and forth, and so you can see the action in sequence if you're doing your straight ahead animation. Right? So it's not in between any animation that we're doing right now. We're doing straight ahead, so we can just roll flip like this to see whether or not it's moving correctly. 
So now, because this one here is stretching out a little bit more, what I want to do is I want to do the same thing with the other one. You can, or you know, depending on what you want to do, uh, modify it. But again, you sort of follow through with whatever is is indicated by the general piece of animation that you've started off. So I'm just going to stretch this out a little bit here, so it gets a little bit more pull. So it's like this part here is hanging just a little bit longer and stretching out. The wily e. coyote thing that we spoke about before. So now this is my contact point when I hit the ground here. So this part, second part of the body, is still going to be trailing. And once again, I might want to still stretch it out even further here. Get more of a pull. And then my next drawing is my squished position hard on the ground. And so I'm not going to stretch it out the same way. I'm going to get a little bit of an impact here where part of the body here squishes into it, but the upper part is still stretching just a little bit. So I'm doing two things at the same time. I'm both stretching it and squishing it. So this part here is still stretched, but this part here is impacted on to the surface of the body. Now here's where you have to understand what it is that you're doing in order to get this next part to work properly. So in this part here, it's going back up again. Now, if I wanted to, what I could do is I could rotate his entire body and make his upper torso trail by pulling this part back here like this. So his body is actually flipping back in this direction here. He impacts down and his head and his body go back in this direction here. Or what I could do is I could compress this part here right on top of it, keep it balanced here, but just squish it down so it's being impacted. So the, the force of the action is coming down this way, but then it's being driven back this way, and so the top ball just stays on top, right? So it balances together with it. So it depends on how you want to approach it with your character. Now I know for a fact that I do have a tail on my character, so if we just back up here and I just talk a little bit about the tail, if this is the character's torso down here, like his <coughs> hips, then I'm going to want to have that tail trailing in behind like this. So this is exactly the same thing that we did on the double ball bounce. If I just limit it to a single line, that's what it would look like coming out like that. The thickness of the tail would extend out here and go off screen just a little bit, depending on the length of it. This one here would pull from here, and I might get a little bit more of a stretch to it. I'm just going to limit this to, to a single line, just so you can equate it back to what we did in the first class, and then I'll just go back and touch it up just to show you on the key drawings what the volume would look like. So in this next one here, this is the first contact point, so I might want to pull this out just a little bit, just to show a little bit of an impact there on that part, but not a lot. And I'm following through with the path of action on the tail is coming through like this, so I'm just tracing back the two previous drawings where the lines are, right through here. You can see my arc is coming down this way, so I've got to follow that same path of action. I can't deviate off of that. And you remember from last week's class, when I sat down with you to review your pencil tests, a lot of people had taken that tip, even though, remember I said specifically, do not curl the tip outside the path of action, yet people still did it. Remember I said, don't do it. I said it several times, and yet people still did it. So either you weren't listening to what I was saying while I was talking about it, or your mind just completely beamed out. Right? It's a principle that you have to follow. If you create a path of action, and something is trailing, it must follow that path of action religiously. You can't deviate out from it, otherwise it's going to create a wobble. So the only reason you would do it is if you did it consistently, whereas it came down, it wobbled at one side, then it wobbled in on the next one, and then it wobbled back out again. So it did create an actual wobbling effect, and you were doing it on purpose. But if it's just one drawing where it goes out, it means you just goofed up, and you weren't thinking about what you were doing. So now in this next one, we have the full impact on the lower torso. So this is where we can start to flatten the tail out here, where this part actually hits the ground. But then it's got to curl back and up and in, like this. All right, so see how the tip is following this line of action that's running through here from the previous drawing. 
Now, as it goes back up, here's where I can now take the tail and flip it down and curl into the contact point onto the ground. So I have to go back into this line here where it's touched and drag it up and out. Now just another little point here, when we're doing this type of a drawing, remember back when we started into our in-betweens assignments, we had the one in-betweening assignment that had the circles on it and I had the cross contours on it to describe the direction that that object was rotating in. Now that we're starting to get into a character here, we have to start thinking in terms of three-dimensional drawing as well. And what is the orientation of this character's body to us, the, the viewer, or the camera? And so if we think in terms of the fact that this character is coming in here like this, we might want to have the character in a three-quarter front view so that he doesn't look like we're looking at him straight on the side. So this might be the center line coming down through the middle of his body. So down through his chest here, down through his pelvis, into his crotch area there. Chest. Down into the crotch.